so that's kind of what got me into this. Um, radio scanning is more kind of about what's out there. Uh, you can hear airplanes talking to uh, the control tower. You can hear uh, engineers talking to the railroad base, uh, police, fire, dispatch. But uh, signals intelligence is more about targeting somebody specific. You see somebody you know is communicating uh, and trying to get into whatever it is that they are talking about. Uh, so really infiltrating radio is uh, targeting your search to transmissions from a very specific person, group, or organization. Uh, so this is kind of a really newbie entry, entry level uh, intro to signals intelligence. Uh, SIGINT is gathering intelligence by intercepting signals from the target. Um, and we're going to focus on the actual signal detection. There's a whole bunch of various concepts with signals intelligence. Uh, signal detection is kind of finding uh, the actual frequencies that are being in use, the protocols being talked on, and that kind of stuff. Uh, I kind of talked about, uh, I guess I would file it under colon, but uh, uh, the various reasons you might want to do this are situational awareness. Um, you're at the mall, or you're at a shopping center, or you're in an entertainment amusement park, Listening to radio traffic can kind of tell you what's going on. Um, gives you a little bit of a clue as to, uh, you know, your situational awareness. Uh, there wasn't a time not very long ago we were at the zoo, and we actually knew that there was somebody with a gun in the park before uh, security knew. Or as security found out, we actually heard about it on the radio. Um, you guys may remember that um, not very long ago. Also, sometimes it's fun just to look around, you see somebody with a radio, and uh, have fun with the challenge of finding the frequency. <coughs> and then, of course, colon. Uh, sometimes you can hear, uh, there's a Wendy's across the street, and they use a little radio frequency headset. Um, I can't actually hear it from here, because it's a very low power, but uh, sometimes you can have some fun with that, let's say. Um, <coughs> They're, they're bi-directional communication, so you can, uh, you can hear what the person is saying into the intercom uh, as they're in the drive through lane, and you can also hear on a different frequency what the uh, cashier is saying to them. And you may or may not be able to inject fun things into that conversation. Uh, since I'm FCC licensed, I don't do that. <coughs> also, there are a few other legal issues here that I'm going to cover. Um, there are certain radio frequencies that you really ought not to uh, intercept. Um, FCC makes it illegal to receive uh, or to intentionally listen in on telephone conversations, pager communications, encrypted signals. Um, it's also in illegal to use uh, radio monitoring if you're in the middle of trying to commit a crime. So <laughs> they, this is one of those things where they don't just bust you uh, because you have a radio. But uh, if you're trying to rob a bank or you're trying to shoplift from a store and you've got a radio tuned to mall security and you're trying to figure out where they're looking for you to help evade, um, they can also add an additional charge onto you for that. Um, and also some cities like the one I live in in Winnetka, they have this stupid code of fire it's rubbish in their, uh, in their city code. It basically says you can't scan for police officers from your car. They do that by implementing this kind of thing, which is just rubbish. Um, technically, the ham radio I have in my car that I use for storm spotting is illegal in Lenexa, Olathe, Shawnee, and Overland Park because it can also receive frequencies that they use. Um, now, they're all digital, and I can't make sense of any of those without using some tricks that Shogo will hopefully help us with when he gets here. But those are some of the legal issues with this kind of stuff. <coughs> and yes, there, uh, I'm going to cover, I'm going to cover trunking here in just a second. Um, there's basically three common signaling types in use that I'm going to cover. Uh, one is simplex where, um, how many of you have used uh, FRS radios, cheap uh, department store walkie talkies, that kind of stuff? That is, uh, that's technically half duplex, we call it simplex. Uh, but that's radio talks to the radio. Once you get 
you know, two blocks apart in the city, uh, a mile or two apart in the, in the woods, you can no longer hear the other person. Um, duplexes where uh, you have typically each radio transmits on a different frequency than it listens. And we use that for repeater communication. So uh, when I take my ham radio here that I've got uh, and I'm out in the field storm spotting, I, I listen on one frequency, and when I press the button, it switches frequencies and talks to a tower way up in the sky on a different frequency. And then that gets retransmitted out on the frequency everybody listens to. And it happens in real time. Um, and so that's, that's how a lot of business repeater systems work. That's how a lot of ham radio systems work and how some GMRS systems work. Um, so if you find yourself listening to... It, this is popular with security things in, in widespread places like parks. Uh, you'll hear just a one piece of a conversation. It sounds like somebody's talking to themselves every two or three minutes. You're probably on the input frequencies of that repeater system. Um, there's a couple of ways to figure out what the output frequency usually is. Um, I'm not really going to cover that, but you basically want to just keep scanning around. It's usually within five megahertz of that. Trunk systems try to share a very small number of frequencies, say um, 8 or 16, among a vast number of talk groups. Um, this is what uh, KCK Police Department is using, for example. They've got about 12 frequencies. Uh, they, with that, cover ambulance dispatch, fire, police, and they've also got tactical channels. So if there's something like a police chase that requires um, three or four officers plus dispatch to be involved, uh, they can take care of that kind of on a different channel. And when a domestic violence call comes in, they can still dispatch somebody in the field and it's not tying up any insurance. Uh, this mess here is a, uh, just a real quick look at some of the frequency bands that make for interesting listening. Um, I don't have them here on my screen, but uh, typically, you'll find businesses between 151, 155 megahertz, and then up um, actually close to the same frequencies that are used for GMRS and, and FRS radios. Um, us hams, you can hear talking in all sorts of frequencies, but those are two popular ones for uh, voice communications, and your average handheld scanner from Radio Shack comes with these up. And uh, aviation has its own set of frequencies. Um, these are interesting. Aviation uses amplitude modulation, which is it's different from FM. It's AM like your AM radio. But uh, if you've ever been driving cross-country, uh, you'll hear your FM station sometimes just fade out, and it'll seem like you get a slice of this channel and a slice of this channel, and it kind of goes back and forth until the other channel really is strong enough to hold it. Um, AM doesn't cut in and out like that. AM, two people, three people can talk right over one another, and you can actually hear all of them at the same time. That's important for airplanes. You don't want one airplane guy talking over everybody else and overriding. Uh, a couple other frequency bands. I'll, uh, I'll have these slides up, and you guys can uh, use these to kind of play with. Uh, this bottom graphic is just a map of frequencies I found on the FCC website. only covers a very small part of the frequency range, but uh, that's where most of this stuff is happening. So how do you listen to and find these stuff? Um, the, the cheating way is to find a smartphone app like Radio Scanner. Uh, if you fire up Radio Scanner, I've got a screenshot here. Um, you can just see a list of uh, known systems, and you can actually just click on one and listen to it. Yes, it's coming to you via wireless because it's going over Wi-Fi, but that's not really the point. Um, <laughs> You can use a frequency counter or a bug detector. You can find these on eBay for uh, 40 or 50 bucks. Um, they don't really work good to find bugs. Most modern bugs are in the 2.4 gigahertz, 5 gigahertz range these days, but um, they are actually pretty good at finding um, baby monitors, uh, the uh, video cameras that were popular 10 years ago. Uh, they can actually kind of tell you where those frequencies are, and then you can tune in with a, with a receiver, a dedicated receiver. Um, inexpensive radio scanners from Radio Shack, ham radios. Uh, this will receive from about 500 kilohertz up to a gigahertz. Um, and a lot of ham radios will do that kind of stuff. And then uh, uh, 
Joel is next. He's going to go ahead and talk about the uh, USB dongles and, and stuff like that. Um, another way you can find frequencies uh, is by uh, just doing some research. Um, companies that register with the FCC have coordinated frequencies. Uh, their licenses are online for everybody to see on the FCC website. A lot of people republish this data. It's very searchable. Uh, you can search Oak Park Mall security frequencies. Um, you'll find radio reference right there. And uh, um, you'll have a list of frequencies that have been coordinated and allocated for them. Um, also, a lot of the people that use scanners have mailing lists, Yahoo groups, Usenet, uh, Google groups. And they discuss things that they find. Um, so, you know, the internet is a good place to start searching for this. Um, observations. While I was here in the crowd, I saw somebody with a, with a radio. Um, it's one of the waitresses. It took me just a few minutes to find out what frequency that Barley's was using. And uh, <coughs> um, I don't know, but uh, I do know if I press this button, they will hear it. Anyway, uh, Motorola just uses a handful of frequencies. Most of their radios are just pre-popular. Yes. yes, yeah, there was one right there. Um. <laughs> Do it again. Do it again. Oh, okay. Anyway. The little light went up on my on my radio here, so I think we actually did it. Um, uh, I've got a I've got a bank of memory channels here that has a whole bunch of just typical Motorola frequencies in it. Um, so I flipped to that bank because I saw a Motorola radio on somebody and said, "It scans." So a couple minutes later, I heard somebody. Uh, this is really boring stuff. You can hear what cable ordered what brand. Situational awareness. <coughs> Uh, yeah. Uh, if somebody has a Part 90 certified radio here, uh, we could do that, maybe. Yeah. Um, let's see. Uh, you have to get it certified by the FCC. It's a real pain in the butt. Um, uh, of course, I, I skipped over to this slide. Scanning. Uh, uh, one, one thing is, uh, if you see a short, stubby antenna like uh, on your FRS radio, uh, typically it's UHF, it's usually in the 400 megahertz band. You start scanning around 450, 460 megahertz, uh, and you just loop that 450 to 470 space for long enough, you'll hear whatever it is they're talking about more than likely. I did run into one place, uh, hospitals are starting to go with digital, uh, they're not trunks, they're not duplex, they're just digital spread spectrum radios. You'll have to use some SDR hackery to find those. Uh, they usually spread their stuff out around 40 channels, and they only spend about 200 milliseconds on each channel. And they just hop around in a pre-programmed way, very, very hard to listen to. Uh, you can sit there and, and, and listen, and you'll just hear but, toot, but, going on. And so all the other radios follow each other, and it works really well. It's probably super random. Um, and I think, I have reason to believe that some of the systems have not a repeater, but a controller, something that's kind of a, a time sink for them that tells them what frequency to use in what order. Because um, I found a, um, I found a digital thing in the range there while I was at the hospital that was just sitting there churning out stuff that sounded like modem noise. And it was on one of the frequencies that the radios are designed to receive. So. I haven't quite dug into those. I'd actually need to get a few of those radios and actually play with them. And they're really expensive, $400 a piece or something. Uh, so uh, scanning is one way to uh, find them, you know. And hopefully, you know, bigger antennas like this that you see on a radio, like a business radio, you might think uh, those are more in the 150 megahertz and shorter antennas, probably more in the 400 and some megahertz range. Um, the last thing is a frequency counter. I don't have a live demo for this, but a frequency counter, a real lab-grade frequency counter, you hook it up to the antenna output, and it, it measures the actual frequency being used. Um, 
uh, cheap frequency counters like the old ones you find from Radio Shack, they work a lot like the bug detectors in that uh, they do a really fast scan and can kind of narrow in on uh, frequencies that are being transmitted very, very close by. Uh, so I would need to be uh, compared to Joel from somebody of all their passion. And I've done this um, at my local hen house, actually. I was just standing there at the customer service desk waiting for somebody to buy their 15 lottery tickets and stuff, and I'm just trying to get a refund on something. And uh, the lady's sitting there talking on the radio, and I pull out my radio and hit the frequency counter mode, and sure enough, I found their frequency right there. So um, That's kind of the very basics of trying to narrow in on uh, where the frequencies are that are being used uh, using analog devices and, and things like this. Um, Joel's going to cover uh, the SDR and the basics of SDR stuff. And uh, you can also use these cheap SDR dongles. Um, now, you know, it's a little easier to carry one of these than it is to carry a full laptop with a big antenna thing hanging off of it. But, uh, you know, if you start to get serious and you want to sit in a parking lot and play around, laptop's not a bad way to go. And I'll hand it off to Joel. Yo! VGA dongle this time around. All right, SDR Sharp is a program that uh, was made to interface with very, very cheap Chinese uh, USB TV adapter. So I'm gonna go over just the basics, and I'm gonna do it real quick, just to save more time for the uh, guys coming after me. Uh, I'm gonna go after, we're gonna install SDR Sharp and do the driver setup, and then I'm gonna tell you about uh, a it's, a, it's a virtual sound driver, so you can actually type uh, sound from one application to another inside Windows. I mean, there's real operating systems that you know, do that well natively, but I don't have one of those with me. <laughs> okay, sdrsharp.com. So if you're interested, spend about 10 bucks at eBay and get uh, the SDR Sharp software and you're in business. Uh, so essentially, just to install it, uh, uncompress the zip, uh, go to the install folder, and then there's the uh, <laughs> run me, uh, the install dot dot. So it goes through, downloads the newest version of the software, and then at that point, it creates a folder called SDR Sharp, and you can run it from there. And I'll do a demo of that. Um, one problem about drivers is that uh, the driver here, it's the DVD, uh, it's essentially it's just anything with an RTL uh, chipset you can use with this. But in order to get the drivers to work, you have to use the uh, Zodrig, uh, Z-O-D-R-G utility that comes with uh, SDR Sharp. And essentially what that does is that it substitutes in the correct driver for the USB device. And when I was going around and looking on the internet for how to set up a cheap uh, 225 scanner, uh, they recommended you pay 25 bucks or something like that for some uh, virtual sound card app. And so I found one that's for cheap or free, depending on how uh, nice you are to the fellow. <laughs> and so it's right there. And I'll put these uh, slides up online once we're done. Okay, so usually on uh, eBay, these things cost about you know ten bucks. So if you're spending more than ten dollars on one of these dongles, you've spent too much. Okay, so you spent twenty-five bucks at a conference, you got no, 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 <laughs> you got screwed. Um, so what can you do to accessorize your ten-dollar investment? Uh, by the time you're done accessorizing with this, you've probably doubled or tripled or quadrupled the cost. So. Usually the little default antenna that comes with it is only about yay big, and it's cheap wire that's braided, that's badly soldered to the actual antenna itself. So 
usually it's not that great. So getting a proper antenna really helps out a lot. Otherwise, uh, unless you're standing right next to it, it better be pumping you know, several hundred thousand watts. And then I'm going to do it again. Uh, first off, I'm just going to kind of point out the features here. Um, at the top here is going to be a tuner, and then we're going to be uh, looking at something called the waterfall. And then you'll see the actual features and measures that we do. Project that I talked about for installing the riser. Okay, so it doesn't show up in the device list. So in order to see everything, first I have to have the dongle plug in and show that to get the information. So I have to plot it in and say install device. And then I should have the RTL set up. RTL 2838. probably wants me to reboot, so I'm not going to do that. Oops. Dang, we're going down. set up the caching. I'm going to do search and then we'll go for RTL USB. Search and we will try ABC something see the signal on the waterfall. So this here will allow you to tune it, find the center of the channel, should play that in audio, although the tuner is going off, so. Anyway, you can see the all the frequencies going inside this whole swath of stuff. It's going great. Anyway, okay, uh, and without further ado, next in line here we have Luke. Oh, yeah.
right, so I'm going to be talking about uh, software, using software-defined radio for um, basically analyzing various radio frequencies. So the real cool thing about software-defined radio is it lets you look at things that you might not really otherwise be able to look at. With, um, with FM radio or something like that, you can obviously tune in to something. There's radios all over the place that, are, uh, that, that you can use as they were designed, but with... Uh, with software-defined radio, you can look at almost anything across the spectrum as long as you can tune into it. So um, it's, re it's really cool. I think it's like uh, buffer overflows were in 1990. Like everybody knew they existed kind of, but people weren't really doing them anything with them. But now that these software-defined radios are, are uh, becoming popular, people are going to start um, finding vulnerabilities in systems that people just thought, hey, nobody can exploit this. It's on 800 megahertz. Nobody has an 800 megahertz transmitter. Um, so I think this is going to be a really big thing over the next 10 years or so, um, kind of along with the Internet of Things um, that's kind of big now. People are going to um, you know, be standing up things that sit on 800 megahertz that listen to you know, um, d different commands over, over, over a radio frequency. So I think this is really cool what we have here. Um, there's uh, so there's many known and unknown protocols. I, I guess I mirrored here, so I can I can actually uh, get out of presenter mode um, and click on my link uh, if it slowly loads. Um, th you know, you obviously think about wa radio like uh, Wi-Fi and 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 um, just the just the standard radio protocols like walkie-talkies and maybe maybe cell phones, uh, but there's a lot of weird stuff that's going over the waves. Um, if you if you if you look down here, I mean there's uh, there's pager traffic that you can look at. There's all sorts of different stuff that you can just read. Um, where, where where sorry I I uh, meant a little. Uh, there's train signaling, so you like trains communicate with each other. Like the the middle engine on the train communicates with like the front engine, and it does things with the train. Tells it that it's running at full speed or tells it it should break. That's that's kind of, I mean, it, it makes sense, but it's kind of weird that that all goes over RF. So you can, um, I mean, the the different engines will broadcast to each other to tell them when they should break and everything. That's that's it's pretty crazy stuff. Um, let me see if I can get out of this. Uh, I have no idea how I got there. F11? All right. Yeah, worked. Um, but now I'm out of my... Uh, you must be good with computers. <laughs> All right. So the, there's, there's the proprietary... Um, so what really interests me about software-defined radio is attacking proprietary stuff, stuff that people thought that nobody could... Nobody could listen to, or nobody could uh, transmit to. Yeah, nobody, no one cared. Um, so there's things like weather sensors. I have one sitting up there, almost the exact same thing. There's things like the microphone that I'm speaking on right now. Um, they probably weren't designed with security in mind, um, and I didn't probably didn't purchase them with security in mind. But there are um, things that an attacker could uh, potentially eavesdrop on or maliciously transmit to. Um, so those are pretty like household items, you know, just talking, temperature sensing. Uh, but there's a lot of other stuff that's uh, impactful. Um, there's your, there's your key fob. Uh, someone can r basically read and retransmit your signal. If there's weaknesses, they can brute force and it, uh, unlock your car. There's a, a talk of black hat that did that. Um, it was on a basically an older model car, but uh, you can. I mean, that's I'm. Guessing somebody's screwing something up somewhere, and and we're gonna find out about it in a few years once it's everywhere, and they're gonna have a huge issue to fix once there's 12 million cars that have this thing that everybody can break into with a $13 device, and by obviously by identifying this stuff earlier rather than later, we can uh, help them uh, and secure those things. There's things like uh, wireless keyboards. Um, those those transmit the sensitive data, obviously that you're typing in, over uh, some sort of radio frequency. There's things like baby monitors; those were in the news a little while ago for being being hacked. Those transmit fairly sensitive things over wireless frequencies. 
There are things like alarm systems. Um, those also transmit sensitive things over wireless frequencies. There was a, uh, a guy that was jamming like ADP or you know, some various al wireless alarm systems. I think what they do now is, is they'll uh, put wireless transmitters at, at some various locations that are either battery powered or something. Um, but either way, they transmit over a frequency and someone was able to jam them and evade the jamming detection so someone could just break into your house and not, it, it, the system wouldn't go off. So th um, and they could also, of course, trigger the alarm if they wanted to uh, for no reason. Uh, I think one of the systems, they could get the code back to unlock the system. Um, all sorts of bad stuff in, in those, going over those airwaves. So, th so, th so th what I'm getting at here is there's so many, you know, kind of endless amount of devices as you, look, as you look around your house and around your office that are uh, transmitting over proprietary radio frequencies. Um, so to do all this, there's a program called GNU Radio, and it's very powerful and, and, and quite painful to use. It uh, ha has pretty bad documentation. Um, it's getting better, uh, but it's kind of the de facto standard, and it's, it's a free open source program. Um, so it's good, but it's, uh, it's lacking in, uh, sometimes. So what you do is you build flow graphs. You can, you can write code to do it, but you can also just build kind of drag and drop flow graphs to do what you want to do with a radio signal. Um, here's one that listens to FM radio. Uh, it's kind of the hello world of, uh, radio, uh, of, of GNU radio, it's just building an FM radio flow graph because it's really easy to listen to. You can listen in on wireless mics with uh, GNU radio. Um, I'll, uh, I'll show you that here. Uh, I think, let's see what I'm, uh, I'll launch uh, a similar, uh, probably up to, oops. Um, I, th I looked up one of these mics earlier, and actually y you can, in that screenshot I showed on from, from, uh, from Amazon, the frequency is highlighted there. Uh, you probably can't see it with the resolution we have, but uh, you can see what frequency it is, and then uh, this is a similar program uh, to what Joel just showed. It's called GQRX. It's similar to STR Sharp. Whoa, we're getting weird stuff here. Oh, sorry, it's it's me talking late. Uh, I'll go ahead and kill that before it yeah before it starts with the feedback. Uh, sorry, it was talking late enough that I didn't didn't recognize. Kind of a little bit distorted, but you can tune in to things like that very easily. Uh, thanks. Um, and uh, so that's that's kind of one cool thing. It's pretty basic um, to do that, but and I have no idea why. Do you guys know why the th there's like a bunch of frequencies across the spectrum instead of just one? All right, I didn't either. <laughs> um, <laughs> science. All right. Uh, so that's uh, that's one way to listen to just raw audio. Uh, if someone's transmitting that, um, there's you know kind of endless possibilities for why someone would do that. Uh, and then if you wanna, what I, what I did was I focused on this uh, wireless temperature sensor that I had in my house. It's kind of uh, I just wanted to pick one thing that I didn't know how to read, um, so that's that's what I focused on. And you know, it could be because I didn't have a train to hack into. I I, I went with my weather sensor. Um, <laughs> the uh, so, but but that's I mean, it could be some similar protocol. Or, you know, it's if you if you can do, um, there's probably no security in the train protocol. That's telling trains to put on their brakes, and there's probably no security in the in the weather protocol. Um, so you can take raw signals using uh, GNU Radio, and actually, I can show you the block diagram uh, for that. Let's see. Oh, we are at a really bad resolution here. This is not going to be good. Uh, but you can you can uh, record. Um, you can tune into a frequency and demodulate it. Um, it, it probably looks kind of complicated. Some of these are grayed out and disabled, uh, but you can um, demodulate the frequency and, r and write it to a file using uh, the block diagrams, or you can just write straight Python to do it. Uh, but, but once you do that, um, if you 
Uh, at first, you'll have just a uh, um, that signal that was up there a second ago. I guess it's uh, loading live over Wi-Fi. Um, hmm. uh, but that's what you have. I'll just do it this way. Uh, you'll th you'll have this raw signal, uh, and then once you process it through that flow graph, you can have a um, you know, once you actually see the data, every 39 seconds that thing transmits, um, and that's what that that's what a transmission looks like. And when you zoom in on a little bit, you can see the actual data being transmitted over the wire. And then when you zoom in some more, you can actually see. Uh, is still, this isn't enough uh, um, resolution here. Uh, it's not. I guess I guess I lost internet access. Uh, sorry, but uh, when you zoom in more, you can actually see. I don't know if you can see that there, but there's a number of dots. Um, it's not doing anything. Uh, that's made up of a ton of dots. You probably, uh, and that's actually your sample rate. So when uh, software-defined radios or radios, when you hear about like you download an MP3 or WAV file that's 48 uh, kilohertz or something like that, um, each one of those is one of those dots. So that's the number of samples per second it's taking. Um, and that's just basically how it reads it over the wire. So that's uh, zoomed in, just the signal. And you can actually, uh, I don't have a screenshot of it here, but you can actually, uh, or at least on the slide deck, but you can then from there you can just take that signal using um, Python or, or GNU radio and take it to uh, actual code and just, and just read what it is. And then with the software, with these cheap software-defined radios, you can only r listen, but the hacker, there's some, uh, Cheap option, better and better options like the Hack RF and Blade RF that you can actually transmit on. So um, these are just coming out. Uh, they're they're getting cheaper and cheaper, and they're really gonna uh, make a lot more thing, a lot of things more more capable um, as we uh, you know as they come out over the next few months. Um, that's that's all I had. Kevin's next, I guess. So goes here. I see. Thanks. Okay, uh, I'm Kevin Bennett, and I'm going to demo uh, demonstrate for you one of the. Um, he was talking about some frequencies that you can look at that have pretty neat information on it. I'm going to show you one of those. Um, what I'm going to be demoing here is ADS and B, which is automatic dependent surveillance broadcast. So, um, back in about 2010, 2011, the FAA came out, came out with a requirement that all commercial aircraft or all general and commercial aircraft will use a new protocol that will use their GPS to report their position, their ident uh, over a frequency. That frequency is 1090 megahertz. So very convenient. Um, these aircraft will have a box in them that, that they can use in conjunction with their GPS to broadcast where they're at. This is a, uh, a, uh, a, a policy that they are going to make mandatory by 2020 in the U.S. It's actually mandatory in Australia and in some places in the, U in the uh, European Union right now. What this will do is replace some of the older transponder and secondary radars so that base stations, so the air traffic controller, can tune in, have this equipment, tune into a frequency and see where all their aircraft are at. They don't have to use any of this older equipment. It's cheaper and it allows for additional features. Um, their whole premise on this was for safety. So um, again, it will help aircraft who could put this cheap equipment in their aircraft and actually see where other aircraft are at and avoid other aircraft uh, without having to contact the 
the tower and have the tower tell them where other aircraft are. Um, they can use this VFR, which is a visual flight reference, so if they're just flying and they're looking out the window, or in IFR, instruments only. If it's really bad outside, they can also use this equipment to see where other aircraft that they can't see are that may be close to them. Um, some of the other things that it, it may eventually do is also provide in weather in the aircraft. So instead of having a radar on their aircraft, they can use a frequency to get their weather information. Um, some of the stuff that currently ADSB provides is the altitude, the aircraft number, so it's a density, um, it's heading, it's a velocity, so it's speed, and it's, uh, it's a cent or descent rate. Plus also using the GPS, it provides its location. So a couple things you need if you are a, just a hobbyist that want to gather this information is a cheap um, software to find radio, um, an antenna, a decoder software, and then the software to graph out the display. Pretty simple. I use the Realtek RTL, which is what um, he was talking about. It's about 10 bucks. And I also even use the cheap default antenna on there. Um, and it actually works. Um, it's recommended that you build a little bit better antenna. I'm not that far yet. Um, eventually I will for better information. And then the decoder, which I'll show you the software for, and then the actual software. So I've learned not to do live demos, so I'm going to attempt to show you a video of me doing a demo. Hopefully. Okay. So on your computer, you've installed a decoder. Basically, you start that decoder up. It comes into the frequency. Oh, oh sorry. Oh. So this actually starts gathering the packets. You see they're starting to scroll down on 1090 megahertz. Very simple to do. Start up your software that does the mapping. Um, I'm using ADSB Scope. It's free software. You can get it. There, are, there's probably eight, nine different software suites out there that you can get. Um, this is the basic, cheapest one, free. I'm going through and I'm setting up some of the pre-requirements for it, just making sure that it's going to read my decoder. I'm going to set it to my location. I think it's somewhere in Europe right now. Um, I'm going to set it to uh, Missouri. And I'm going to tell it to start receiving data from the aircraft. Now, I was in Lee Summit, actually in the basement. And um, as you can see with the default antenna, I'm typing in my location. I've already started to receive some aircraft. There's an outbound aircraft right there about 25 kilometers out from Kansas City, from where I'm at. I'm able to receive data from aircraft about 150 miles, 150 kilometers out. Now, some stuff to show you with this, it's hard to see, but if you start playing around with it, you've got the aircraft, you've got the aircraft identification number that's being broadcast. You can go online, put in that aircraft identification number, and pull up what aircraft it is. You can also pull up usually what, um, what airline it's flying for, what its destination is, where it's from, um, all from that information right there. You've got the, um, the longitude, the latitude, the altitude. Um, that aircraft right there is, what is it, 12,000 feet? It's 18,000 feet, um, and it's uh, 100 and 180 miles an hour that it's flying outbound from, probably from KCI going someplace. Uh, as you can see, I've picked up two aircraft that are, that are actually broadcasting their GPS location. Again, because this is not mandatory at this time, I'm going to pause it. It's not mandatory at time. You can see I'm actually picking up eight aircraft, but some of the aircraft is not broadcasting its GPS. They're not required to at this time. By 2020, they will be. But I am getting their altitude. A lot of times I'm getting their airspeed. 
um, I'm definitely getting their identification. So I don't know exactly where they're at. I know they're within 150 miles of us. So, you know, right now, or at this time, it was about 8 o'clock last night, there were eight, eight aircraft within 150 miles of Kansas City. Um, it's a really neat program, really easy to work with. Um, again, there's some software out there that is really, really good. This is basic, fun to start playing around with. Um, let's see, one other thing I wanted to show you. Part of um, the FAA requirement, they do have a FAQ about, about this software, about this requirement. And basically what it says, it's actually number 31 on their list because it's not that important. Will the information broadcast by ADSB out be encrypted for security purposes? No, is their answer. So just leaving it there, you could broadcast these packets at that frequency and put an aircraft anywhere in the world if you wanted to. Or a fleet of aircraft, or a formation, cool looking formation or something. Of course it would be illegal, don't do it, but someone could. So I'll leave that there. So I guess I'm am I last? All right. So um, to continue on with the theme of you know hacking RF and software defined radio, one of the things that I wanted to talk about was that um, through the use of these really cheap um, SDR dongles that cost about nine ten bucks each, you can monitor uh, digital trunk radio systems. And so, can anybody give an example of who might use a digital trunk radio system? Like the the police department, maybe, yeah. Three-letter agencies, are they still back there? <laughs> maybe they're gone, good. <laughs> so let's talk, I, and you guys got some of the basics early, and I apologize I came in late. I was um, coming in from, flying in from D.C. today and um, had random bad weather in Detroit, and so, but I think you guys covered some of this, right? Is that right? So simplex communication, it's easy, me, you, walkie-talkies, going back and forth. Um, pretty, pretty good, U we're use useful for most, for most extent, except there are some challenges. And some of them are that as if you've got a walkie-talkie into that frequency, you can jump in the conversation, right? So to solve that, they came up with some access control methods. They're pretty simple. We will use uh, some simple tones and those types of things to help make sure that you're talking or can only talk to or hear the people you want to hear. So maybe, you know, if I'm talking to Noah, for example, and we're using TTCSS, right? So we'll set a frequency in the back end, non-audible, that will basically filter out if, if uh, Wayne Crowder jumped on our frequency and he started talking and yammering, we probably wouldn't hear him because he wouldn't have our code. So that worked for a little while, but then they went to trunking, all right, and we'll talk about duplex and repeaters actually next. So uh, they went to duplex and repeaters. The cool thing about a repeater is that a repeater can a usually have a lot more power strength than a handheld radio. So stick it up on a mountain, it can see for a longer distance, and, and the thing here with a, a repeater system or duplex is using two frequencies. And um, so you're, you're talking up on one frequency, the repeater sends out on another. So you're listening on one frequency and you're transmitting on a different one. You get more, uh, like I said, longer distance, better range out of it. Um, helps to, with some access control problems because a lot of repeaters are restricted. You got to know the input and the output frequency, for example. And if, for example, if you're going to monitor repeater systems, you got to know the output frequency. 
primarily so you can listen in on that those conversation discussions. So, but that led to trunk radio systems, and the the reason they kind of went to trunk radio systems is, oh, well, okay, I, I actually I saw this really cool. Do anybody here like cars? Because I like cars, and um, this was a an SRT8, you know. Dodge that uh, was up at the speedway, and I heard that thing like a mile away. I mean, it had headers. It sounds really cool, and so I had to take a picture. Anyway, so that, I guess KCK has that car, so you can see that on this. I, I actually, I doubt that they use that to patrol with. Um, but anyway, so trunk radio systems. So we know that um, law enforcement, public agencies like to use trunk radio systems. Uh, and the reason that trunk radio systems are pretty popular is that it allows us a pretty efficient use of our bandwidth. So if we're talking simplex, for the majority of the time, that frequency is unused. So what uh, a trunk system allows you to do is pull frequencies together and utilize them in a more efficient way. So that way, 20, 30 people can be talking at one time, but you know, conversation can be relatively quick, five, 10 seconds for each transmission. And so how does it work? So how it, it generally works is that you have some control frequencies or a control frequency, depends on the type of system. And the control frequency basically is on all the time. It's a managed by a computer. And it tells the recipients or the users in the system what frequency to go to when you want to hear transmission. And so there's a, this concept instead of frequencies that you use called trunk groups. So in, in the Kansas City area, actually the whole metro area, most of the law enforcement has on a single trunk system. So they pull together all the frequencies that all these agency owns, the Latham Police Department, the Lenexa Police Department, Kansas City, Missouri Police Department, Kansas Highway Patrol, so they've taken all the frequencies they used to have individually, put them together in this um, trunk system so they can all utilize that. They can even talk to one another if they want. But if the Olisa, Latham Police Department has their own specific trunk groups that they listen to. So when a, uh, when a patrol car wants a guy, uh, someone wants to get on the radio and talk, he keys up his handset. And what actually happens in the back end is that he actually goes out and talks to the control system that says, hey, I want to chat. The control system says, okay, you're on talk group one, two, three, four go to frequency X. And then and all of a sudden it blasts that out to everybody in the Olathe Police Department who's on trunk group 1234. It says, hey, if you want to listen to a conversation on trunk group 1234, everybody tune to frequency X right now. And it happens instantaneously. They go to frequency X. The guy says what he used to say, gets off the radio, and then everybody goes back to monitoring the control channel again. Make sense? All right, cool. So and there's uh, quite a few popular uh, trunk systems out there that are digital. In the area here, they use Project 25, uh, APCO Project 25, and um, it's one that you can easily listen to. So how do you listen to digital radio communication? So um, one, you can go out and buy a digital radio at a couple thousand bucks. You can buy a digital trunk scanner. I've got a scanner here. This is an analog trunk scanner. So this, as of a couple years ago, became obsolete for listening to um, local law enforcement, for example. It works for KCK. I thought they're on uh, Project 25. They're not. Okay. Cool. So if I was in Wyandotte County, I can listen to to them. All right. Um, or you can go out and buy software-defined radio for about 50 bucks, probably probably less than that, maybe 10, 20, depends. All right. Well, I I paid 15 for mine, but that includes shipping, so I don't know. So that was for one. You need two dongles to do it, and the reason you need two. You need one to monitor the control channel, and the other one gets told where, what frequency to change to to listen to whatever communication, trunk group, et cetera, frequency you want to listen to. So that's why, that, how, why you need two of those. And so in order to do that, if you want to use SDR, if you want to spend $3,000 to go buy a used police radio, um, if you're in the cheaper range like you know, I'm kind of interested in is, so you need two SDR receivers. Um, they look like this, and you guys have seen those, and he's got one as well. Um, some so and software. So SDR Sharp, which was already s we've already seen a demo of before. That really, you don't necessarily need that to do the digital comm, but I like to use it because it's an easy to use interface because you've got to find the control channel that works best for you. And you can go out on the web to like radioreference.com. Oops, that's, you're not going to see that, are you? Okay. I know that's probably kind of smart and hard to small and hard to see, but this is the, the page on radioreference.com that shows for the Kansas City um, digital trunk group that most law enforcement agencies on what their trunk group numbers are as well as the control frequencies. So 
You know, if you want to get all crazy, you can plug all these control frequencies in. That's good. Or you can use something like SDR Sharp and find the control frequency for your area that has the strongest signal. All right, and then uh, so that's good and all. And if you're using, if it's a digital voice, if it's a digital trunk system that's using analog voice signals, you'll be able to uh, decode it right off the bat using Unitrunker, um, which is the software that you'll need to to manage the trunking, right? So it controls your two SDR radios, listens to control frequency, and manages the received um, SDR radio. You can also, if, if, if that's not the case, for example, here they use primarily digital, you'll need something to decode the digital communications, and that's where another piece of software comes into play called DSD. So um, I think it's digital something decryption, I don't know, uh, decoding. Um, so DSD will decode the di digital signal so you can actually understand it. So it doesn't sound like, you know, like a modem basically is what they sound like. And then in order to connect, um, in order for DSD to decode that, you need a virtual audio cable and you, you talk to that as well. Yeah, donation where? All right. I, and I use the donation one. So, um, and it seems, it's, it works. The other one is freeware, but every 10 seconds it gives this voice saying, hey, you know, if you're using freeware, please pay for your software. All right, and I was going to give a demo, but unfortunately, um, I just am not prepared. I was on an airplane all day long and um, not ready for that. Um, I couldn't get, I couldn't get, a, I was trying back there to get a frequency, a control frequency that I could pick up here. I know what I could pick up my house in Olathe, but I couldn't pick up anything. I mean, I don't know if it, well, obviously... This is the. This is obviously a really awesome antenna. Not. So. So, yeah. Th this this is not a great antenna. So if you actually want to do something really good with it, the recommendation is, like you said, buy one or build one. Um, I've gotten it to work, but I can't even in, inside this building right even now. I can't even pick up like um, a radio station, FM radio. So, um, I don't think I don't think it's my setup. I think it's it's the antenna. Because we'll try harder. <laughs> yeah. Really try. So interesting use cases. I know we talked a little bit about that earlier, and, and Alex had some great examples. Um, monitoring utility usage. So uh, who in here has KCPNO for your provider? For almost everybody for electricity? Who this summer or over the summer had their uh, meter replaced? I know mine was. You know that those meters are now RF enabled? Go look on the side, it says FCC. So guess what you can do? Well, <laughs> Well, well, for one thing you can do is you can monitor your electricity usage, right? So instead of going out and buying stuff, no, you can't do that. Um, so you can monitor electricity usage. So actually, uh, uh, puts, it puts out, pushes out on a 900 fre megahertz frequency um, your usage report. So it actually has a couple bits of information of it. One of it is a kind of a basically serial number of the meter, and the other one is you know what your meter reading is. And you, the reason why they have that is so a truck can come down your street once a month get your meter reading, meter reading, figure out how much electricity you use, and, and bill you. So if you had a, a, an SDR radio like Hack RF, did you talk about Hack RF? A little bit? Because Hack RF just got released. It's really cool. It's like $299. It's a transmission and receive SDR. Um, I think it's half duplex, but um, still phenomenal price for what it can do. I mean, it basically zero to six gigahertz um, capable radio. So yeah. So, so use cases I thought in my head was you could put something in your front yard that had a stronger signal than your meter, and you could say, hey, guess what? Sugo used 10 kilowatt hours of electricity last month instead of 500. Right? It, it's not encrypted. There's no authentication on it. Luckily, you can't do anything you know, crazy like you know, turn off somebody else's electricity or anything, but you can certainly spoof it. Right? Um, you can analyze, analyze and decode RF data transmission. So we talk about... Um, Drop tape. <laughs> oh, <laughs> to the truck as it comes through? Yeah, you know, I didn't even think. Yes, very true. Yes. Yeah, so you can send a whole bunch of data to it and then see what happens. Yeah, you could do that too. It'd be really interesting to see. What's that? Turn it off? From what I've read, no, I've, I haven't tried it. it it's, pr it's primarily set to just transmit information out. And our water meters are the same way, right? They're, they're radio enabled, so they don't have to come up and read you know, the actual meter itself. 
You can decode a lot of RF transmissions, so pager systems. Um, and so another use case that comes to mind, I was talking to a friend a few weeks ago, um, and, and at some point in the past, he got caught speeding in the middle of nowhere in Nebraska. The police officer went back to his, uh, his vehicle, came back with just a few minutes and said, I'm going to have to give you a warning because right now I'm in an area where I have no radio communication system signal for my laptop to get to issue a ticket. So <laughs> he, the only way he could issue a ticket was electronically. So, of course, that's got gears running my, through my head is, okay, you've got a patrol car. But is Chris still here? <laughs> So if you got a patrol car behind you and somehow you're able to, you know, get a frequency out that's stronger than, you know, what he's trying to, you know, communicate on his laptop, can he give you a ticket? I don't know. You know, who knows? <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of great resources online. Go uh, If you're interested in buying these, like these dongles are cheap. They're 10 bucks, um, 15 bucks if you're getting ripped off like me, I guess. Um, RTL-SDR.com has got great tutorials. Everything to walk you through, through how to do digital trunking setup, um, how to just listen to analog signals, listen to the radio if you want, um, listen to you know this cool wireless mic, um, which we were doing I think last month, right, um, with our SDR uh, dongles. So some pretty cool stuff. There's a lot of things that are RF enabled, and you'd be really really surprised. Everything from weather station. In fact, um, I know that my weather station. I used to have one in my back porch, and the weather thing, uh, the the uh, the temperature thing died a long time ago, but you know, I basically, I found someone else in the neighborhood had one as well. So I hooked it up to my, to my scanner, and then scanner into my laptop, decoded it, and then I didn't have to worry about buying another, you know, thirty-dollar temperature gauge. So, <laughs> or you could just walk outside and say, "Dang, it's hot." <laughs> all right, <laughs> no, all right, cool. That's that's all I had. Um, sorry that I don't have the demo, but. Um, it, it really actually isn't that hard. DSD is pretty easy to use. It is command line, so if you guys like command line stuff, that's kind of cool. It's DOS based. Um, and um, that's it. Any questions? Trent's going to have a really, really big electricity bill next month. <laughs> uh, Shogo. All right, big round of applause for Shogo.